Thank you so much for coming. I'd like to immediately turn the mic over to our illustrious Dean of the Darla Moore School of Business, Peter Bruce. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you so much, Jerry, for that introduction. It's not too loud at the back right. Are we bouncing around a bit? Everything's okay? If you had all been alive in 1945, at the end of the Second World War, American output was approximately 50% of world output. And 95% of what was consumed in America was made in America. And after the Second World War, the Americans were very, very generous. From that period, all the way through until now to some degree, to be the consumer of last resort to the global economy as other nations began to pick themselves up after the crises of the Second World War. Two former adversaries, Japan and Germany, got themselves back on the economic track by either getting help from the United States in the way of loans and or by being an export market for things produced in their countries and consumed in America. By the end of the century, though, we had the entrant of a new power called China. And China, of course, followed exactly the same model with a few differences that Japan did. And China's early modernization from the late 70s and early 80s all the way up until today was done on the basis of an export-led model. And again, exporting mostly to the United States. When I was a younger man, I would travel around the world and everybody that I spoke with was going to export to the United States. And it amazed me because I thought, boy, those Americans, they've got so much purchasing power that everybody in the world could export to us. Things started to change when China became so big that it is now, if you look at purchasing power parity, it's about 23% of world output. We are only 17 or 18%, so China on a PPP basis is bigger than us. If you have a look on a nominal basis, we are about 17% and China is 12%. But China is still looking to export, but more importantly, it's becoming even more committed to industrial policy and to favoring homegrown either new companies, champions, and or supporting local production, probably as we go on further for local consumption. Now, why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because we have many students in this room. The world that I had to deal with and the world that most of us had to deal with on this stage over the last 50 years is, in my opinion, changing significantly. And instead of globalization being the driver where you can make in China, export from there across the world on the basis of that model, that is now changing to more of a regional and to some degree a national model. And as China becomes more and more powerful, I am not confident that the next leading economic power is going to be as convinced about free trade as the Americans were after the Second World War and as the whole model played out in the 20th century. That is why this is such an important event that we have here tonight. And I want to congratulate Jerry. I want to thank the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the SC Chamber of Commerce, for getting together a conversation about international trade, etc. There's a short-term problem and there's a long-term problem. I've already talked about the long-term problem, and that is how will the world order reconfigure and what will that mean for everyone? But the short-term problem is we're having a little bit of trade back and forths, and we may end up in a trade war. We're not there yet, but these things can spiral out of control pretty quickly. And it turns out that supply chains are not as flexible as trade wars are. 
and you need to know about that. And we have people here that are going to be speaking with you about that. I am so glad to be here. Congratulations to the Folk Center for getting this going. And that's enough from me. Students, take this seriously. It's important. It's going to determine the world that you live in for, I think, the next couple of decades at the least, and possibly longer. That's about as good as I can do, Rick. It's my job now to introduce my good friend, Rick, who, by the way, um, is a Gamecock. Um, yeah, I think you can give him a round of applause for that. But what I must say is that his degree is in biology. So we had to give him a visa and a, we know we dropped down the tariffs. So you could be with us tonight to welcome our guests. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, thank you. You know, one thing that's fascinating about uh, trade is change. And when I flew in yesterday, and I don't get a chance to come back to Columbia as much as I'd like, but I walked around the university and I saw change. Uh, when I was a student here in the early 80s, the only thing here was the Carolina Coliseum, so I had to kind of figure my way around. But it is about change. And in my role as Vice President of the United States Chamber of Commerce, where we represent the interests of some three million companies through our various federations and state chambers and local chambers, uh, we give voice to business. And we represent the interest in uh, business, not just in the United States, but around the globe. And I'm honored uh, that my colleague, John Murphy, who you will hear from uh, just in a few minutes, who is an expert uh, in international trade, has joined us. This is the beginning of what I uh, expect to be, and thanks to the Folk Center and, and all of you, a longstanding partnership with the University of South Carolina and this school, because we recognize that the future, not just the future actually, but today, is dependent on our ability to engage uh, academic institutions and moreover, US students, our future business leaders and policy makers across the United States and the world. So thank you so much. It's good to be here. We're happy. I'd also like to introduce you to one of our board members, uh, the chairman of the board of the Folk Center, former governor of the state of South Carolina, and a major figure in international trade and investment. I would, I think. Jim Hodges. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jerry. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. What a great crowd that we have here tonight. Uh, so why am I up here? One, I'm chairman of the uh, Folks Board and really have enjoyed my service. I'm a, a USC Business School grad, 1979. Uh, law school, 1982. You're not going to like that a whole lot here at USC as well but really have enjoyed my association over the years with the business school and with the business leaders in the state and around the country. I lead a, a consulting firm of about 150 people and I'm in a law firm of about 1,000 lawyers that has offices all across the globe. Uh, so trade is near and dear to our heart. Uh, many of our clients are engaged in international trade. Uh, many of our clients have issues that arise out of uh, trade disputes. Uh, but my wife and I uh, funded um, a gift to USC, uh, it would fund every year a gift to USC uh, that involves trying to marry together public policy issues and business issues because we feel very strongly that uh, business students need to know more about public policy uh, and that we need to bring more people to the business school to talk about serious issues that affect our state or our country. Uh, I can think of none that's more important right now than the whole issue of trade. And we do have a terrific panel today to talk about that. And there are many reasons why we want to talk about it. One is that South Carolina happens to have one of the best ports in the country in Charleston. And what happens there, we import and we export. When there are issues that involve limitations on that port, then it hurts us, not only the businesses here, but it hurts our port and it hurts growth and development in and around Charleston. Uh, likewise, we, if my memory is right, we have one of the highest percentages of workforce in the country that work for foreign companies, foreign-owned companies. So as a percentage, more South Carolinians work for uh, people like uh, Continental Tire here, George, than any other state in the country. 
Uh, for that reason, we need to be very sensitive to uh, any disputes or issues that arise over trade and over how it might impact companies that employ uh, people in South Carolina. So there are myriad reasons why I'm interested in this and why you should be interested, but let's hear from the experts who have a lot more to say about this. I'm really looking forward to the program tonight, and Rachel and I are happy to be a, be a part of funding this at my alma mater. Thank you, Governor. I'd just like to introduce to you all now our panelists. Firstly, and uh, our lead presenter is uh, John Murphy from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. John's been there since 1999 uh, and, and basically leading the uh, area of advocacy relating to international trade and investment policy. Uh, John's also, it, it, through the U.S. Chamber and in other roles, he's had an incredible career being involved directly and indirectly with major legislation and major trade deals uh, affecting the United States. Next to him is our dear Wendy Cutler. Uh, Wendy's had almost 30 years of experience in the U.S. Trade Representative, uh, and she's uh, overseen many trade deals and uh, trade agreements, and, and including the negotiations with uh, TPP. And she now is a managing director at the Asia Society Policy Institute in D.C. Their full bios, by the way, are in this. I would uh, recommend you read this. Uh, George Jurt is a board member for us for the Folk Center and has been uh, with uh, Continental since uh, 2000, right? And he has uh, basically led their legal area and has been general counsel for many years. He's had an incredible career at the intersection of law and business around the world. And then finally, uh, we have our other board member for the Folk Center is Jim Barber, and Jim is the Chief Operating Officer of United Parcel Service. And moreover, uh, before that, just before that, he was uh, the head, uh, led their international area, the UPS International, and uh, prior to that, uh, Jim's led uh, the European area for UPS, and how many different countries have you lived in? visit about 40 countries a year. 40 countries a year. So uh, I would think that uh, there's no question in anybody's mind by this point that these people know a bit about international trade and investment right on the front lines. So without further ado, I'd like to bring up John Murphy to take it away. Thank you. So you can hold on to that or do your own life, whatever you want. Well, it's great to be here tonight. Uh, I appreciate the kind introduction, and it's terrific to be here with this uh, incredible panel. Um, as Rick Wade was saying, uh, I work at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We represent a huge swath of the American biz business community, small businesses, big businesses, manufacturers, services, agri agribusiness. And when we talk to them nowadays, what we hear is that business is good. Unemployment is near uh, historic lows. Even though we're in one of the longest economic expansions in history, what we're seeing is that growth is really remarkably strong. Um, and then usually I enter the conversation to talk about trade and everybody says, oh, it's an age of uncertainty. Um, there's a lot going on on trade and some of it's good, um, but some of it is indeed disruptive. And what I'd like to do here in the next little bit is dig into some of that. First, talk a little bit about the real world, um, in business, what's going on in trade trends, then turn to what's going on in Washington where policymakers and the administration and Congress are trying to shape American trade policy, and then look a little bit at the rest of the world, and, and then, uh, then we'll have this, this great uh, group discussion. So where's trade headed? Trade has been growing and growing and growing. Um, the share of the world economy that is taken up by imports and exports today has never been higher. And in the post-war era, basically over the past 75 years, uh, what we've seen is that the share of the world economy that's taken up by trade has risen. This is from 1990 to roughly today. It's gone from about 20% to 40%. More and more stuff is being traded. Trade impacts a larger and larger share of our economy. Uh, one of the reasons for that is that we have lived through a period of remarkable trade liberalization. 
beginning with the general agreement on tariffs and trade in 1947 to today, uh, we've been through a, a series of about a dozen multilateral trade negotiating rounds that have cut tariffs pretty much worldwide. Tariffs, as you can see here, have gone down dramatically. Um, as of a couple of years ago for the US, the, uh, the applied average tariff was about one and a half percent. It's the same for Europe, it's even lower for Japan and so on. So that is one of the reasons why trade has been growing so much. Another is the box, the container, one of the most influential inventions in recent history. In 1956, there was an American trucking magnate named Malcolm McLean, and he had this idea, I'm gonna create a standard size metal box, and when I ship stuff overseas, I'm gonna put everything into these boxes and it's gonna make everything a whole lot simpler and easier. And sure enough, he quickly found that containerization cut the cost of moving goods on and off of ships by more than 90%. Studies show that this has had as big an effect as tariff cuts uh, in terms of driving international trade, and it continues to this day. And, and one other uh, element that I think is really worth mentioning is the digital realm. This is Tim Berners-Lee. He's credited as the inventor of the World Wide Web back in 1989. Uh, and what that did is it took the internet, which had of course been invented not by Al Gore, but by DARPA, a Pentagon program, I think in the late 60s. But the internet was not something that, you know, not geeky people like me could use. The web, though, used the internet and made it, it, it user-friendly so that you could use a mouse and click on things. And that has brought in not just e-commerce, where you can buy things online and have them shipped to your house by UPS. Um, it, it also means that you can actually engage in digital trade. Increasingly, the entire transaction of things we do is entirely online. Financial services can be traded online across borders. You can buy insurance online. You buy software, you download the software completely online. Is it a good, is it a service? I don't know. But increasingly we're trading not just in goods and in services, but in data. So trade just grows and grows and eats up more of the world economy. Um, but in recent years what we've seen is maybe we've started to hit a wall. With the Great Recession, there was a sharp drop in trade Afterwards, we had a recovery. You can see that the, the trough there bounced back, but we haven't had the same strong growth in trade in the years since then. And one of the reasons for that is we appear to be seeing more protectionist barriers applied around the world. Uh, look at the red line, not the others. The red line is new protectionist measures that governments, including the United States, have put into place um, in the past few years. It's a pretty, a remarkable uptick there. That's tariffs, but also many other kinds of non-tariff barriers. That's part of the story of what's going on here in the slowdown in trade growth. Now, come with me now away from the real world to the swamps of Washington. Let's, let's see what's going on in, in trade policy. And, you know, but first from the perspective of the business community, you know, trade presents huge opportunities uh, for American business. It's estimated that 41 million American jobs today depend on international trade, and it's in every state in the union. Um, about 12 and a half million Americans work in manufacturing. About half of those owe their jobs to exports. And trade isn't just the province of big companies, uh, small and medium-sized companies, about 300,000 of them are exporters today. 98% uh, of all exporters, uh, numerically speaking, are small and medium-sized businesses. And here in South Carolina, that's true too. I know many of you are not from South Carolina, but it's interesting to look at the state where you're living and studying now. Uh, more than half a million jobs in this state depend on trade. One of the remarkable things about South Carolina's uh, recent successes is the number of uh, people employed by foreign companies that have come and invested here. I believe this state has, uh, per capita, the most foreign direct investment of any uh, state in the union. It's a remarkable success story. And, you know, so the numbers are impressive. The number of companies exporting, the number of jobs. Trade means opportunity. Um, 
Now trade, it's not a cure-all, it's not a panacea. Uh, there's all kinds of problems with it too and we'll get into it. Um, but when you're the president of the United States, you have to look at the good and the bad. And this is a quote from President Trump. Um, and you know, he's really talking about trade here in much the same way as other presidents have. Presidents tend to look at international trade and trade agreements as an opportunity to shape globalization, to, to write the rules of trade. Now, he uses a few adjectives that maybe his predecessor, uh, immediate predecessor didn't, but, you know, American carnage and so on. But, you know, it's not that different. But there are differences, and I just want to touch on a couple of them on how this administration uh, thinks about international trade. So, first of all, a lot of it is about manufacturing. Uh, when the administration talks about trade, they're often talking about manufactured goods, especially cars and steel. Um, and this is a very important graph to understand um, and think about the Trump administration's view on international trade. See the blue line, the, um, or the red line rather? The red line represents the output of American manufacturing since World War II. That red line is going up and up and up. And what that is saying is that American manufacturers are making more stuff than ever before. Uh, their production's up, their revenue's up, their sales are up. Now the blue line shows employment in American manufacturing. And what you see here is that employment in American manufacturing peaked in 1979 and has gone down since then. Um, in, fact, in fact, you can see there's this particularly steep bit after the year 2000. Now, does that mean that manufacturing is being hollowed out and jobs are being sent overseas? No, that's exactly what it doesn't mean because the manufacturers are making more stuff, but they're doing it with fewer workers. What's been going on in manufacturing is an incredible productivity revolution where automation, increasingly sophisticated capital goods, um, and, uh, and just huge efficiencies are allowing manufacturers to make more stuff with fewer workers. This is a, a real political challenge in our country today. There's no easy answers to it. And I think that the administration is right to think about and wrestle with this issue. Um, but you have to have the right diagnosis. And this graph, I think, adds an important element here. Um, it's the same output line there, the light blue line as on the last graph that shows the output of American man manufacturers going up. What the orange line is, is saying, though, is that uh, exports of manufactured goods are a huge part of what has allowed U.S. manufacturers to do well. If it hadn't been for exports, there's no way we would be seeing this continued growth in U.S. manufacturing. Now, are we in a trade war today? Uh, you can answer this question yourself maybe uh, later on in the evening, but there have been quite a bunch of complicated steps that we've seen here in the past couple of years that I want to touch on quickly here. Um, starting about a year ago, uh, the Trump administration imposed tariffs on imports of steel and aluminum, basically from all over the world. A few countries agreed to a quota instead of a tariff. It has largely the same effect. This has had uh, an impact on the U.S. economy in several ways. The first effect is that it drove up prices. The United States today is um, uh, it's a place where for manufa manufacturing in the United States, in many ways, it's very attractive. We have low energy costs, our labor is very productive. Uh, but when it comes to steel costs, um, American steel manufacturers, this is the hot rolled band price of steel, is uh, at least 50% higher than it is in Europe or Asia. And these tariffs are a big part of it. When the tariffs were imposed about a year ago, they caused prices to spike, and there were shortages in a lot of categories. What this graph shows you is that steel prices have started to come down again, but they're still a lot higher than they are uh, among our major peer competitors in trade. Um, and this has had uh, an effect on all kinds of manufacturers because for every one job in steel mills or aluminum mills, what we see is that there are 45 jobs in other manufacturing sectors that use steel and aluminum as an input. Now, take GM, Ford, and Chrysler here. Each of those companies, GM and Ford at least, is paying about a billion dollars a year more for steel and aluminum for their production than they were before these tariffs. What this graph tells you is 
That is a big deal even for gigantic companies like these. The, uh, the orange bars are showing the benefit they got from the Tax Cut and Jobs Act about, what, 16 months ago now. Uh, that tax cut has been very beneficial to a lot of businesses across the country. Um, but the tax cut that they got has now been overwhelmed by these higher costs for metals that they use in making cars and trucks. Another effect of these uh, steel and aluminum tariffs has been retaliation from around the world. There's been about there's been retaliation uh, against about $40 billion worth of US exports from Canada, from Mexico, from Europe, from China. Here's a few products that are made in South Carolina that have been hit with these tariffs. Auto parts, automobiles, you know, Volvos and BMWs made in South Carolina um, have been shipped to China. That's increasingly less the case now because of these tariffs. Uh, we've seen uh, the, the recreational boat industry is that's actually a sector that's been hit several different ways. They're paying a lot more for the aluminum, which is a big input for them. Uh, but they're also hitting uh, tariffs when, they, when you try to sell a boat to Canada, for instance. There's tariffs on that now as well. So it's a pretty big deal for a state like South Carolina that depends on trade. Um, now, there's another uh, related threat that's on the horizon here as well, which is the possibility of tariffs on autos and auto parts. This has not happened yet, but the, there's a report at the White House today under which we may see tariffs applied here. And this would be a really big deal, uh, including for South Carolina. Uh, one of the proposals apparently is that there would be a 25% tariff levied on all imports of autos and auto parts. Uh, the impact of this on the US economy would probably be 10 times larger than what we saw with steel and aluminum because it's such a big sector of the economy. Industry is united against it. So GM, Ford, and Chrysler, Hyundai, Volkswagen, Volvo, everybody, everybody is opposed to this. Um, and it's not clear what's going to happen. It would have a really big effect on the economy in that it would send up the app price of a car by an average of about $4,000. Uh, auto dealers, which are big employers across the country, they really don't like it. And I, I find the auto dealers a very interesting angle on this. You know, Auto dealers are very politically active, and um, they're, they've been mobilizing against this. And uh, it's unclear what's going to happen, but this is something that bears watching. And then there's China. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into that here as well. Um, that's the big kahuna of these trade discussions or trade war, whatever, whatever you choose to call it here. It's a little different than some of the other issues I just mentioned, because there's actually broad agreement in Washington that Chinese industrial policies are in many ways a problem and they need to be addressed. China's theft of intellectual property, its forced uh, tra uh, transfer of technology uh, policies, subsidies given to industry there, state-owned enterprises that compete unfairly. The, the Trump administration in the eyes of much of the business community and Congress is right to take on these issues. Now, there's support on the diagnosis in terms of the remedy that's been proposed here, which is tariffs. That's where we start to see the consensus break down, though. Uh, tariffs, at the end of the day, are a tax imposed on American consumers, on American importers and businesses. Businesses actually account for about half of all U.S. imports. And about $250 billion of imports from China have been subjected to tariffs. Now, the impact of this <clears throat> has been difficult for much of the US economy. There's several studies mentioned here. You know, the agricultural impact has been very hard across the heartland. Uh, but this Institute of International Finance study I found very compelling. That China's retaliation has really hit US manufacturers hard. There's about 900 product categories where US exports to China have just collapsed. That's about $40 billion of exports a year that have dried up. So, we are being harmed in this, in this exchange as well. Um, as you know, though, I'm sure you're all reading it in the press, we appear to be drawing near some, some kind of a deal between China and the United States, which hopefully will lend it, uh, lead itself to an end to these tariffs. Um, we think that uh, the White House, particularly in December, when we saw the stock market take a serious dip, um, usually on days when it looked like the China talks were going badly, this seemed to drive home the message that, you know, we need to come to some kind of a deal with China. 
it's unclear whether or not all the tariffs will, will be rolled back, but certainly a lot of them will be. That's, after all, the, the, what China is going to get out of a deal here. Um, and there's also questions about how this is going to be enforced. So we, we are anticipating that in the next month or so that there will be an announcement of some kind of a deal followed by a summit between President Trump and President Xi Jinping. Um, sometimes at this point in the conversation, someone says, well, you know, Murphy, if you're so smart um, and you don't like tariffs, what would you have done? Well, I think one thing you often hear from the business community is, well, we should not be engaging in a global multi-front multi trade war. We should be working with our allies and partners like Europe, Canada, Japan, to form a common front to try and address uh, Chinese industrial policies instead of hitting them with tariffs at the same time. And we should use US trade law. We should use the WTO. We should negotiate new trade agreements like the last administration did in the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Wendy was the chief negotiator, by the way. That is a way to write the rules of trade in a way that's going to favor the United States. Um, in, in wrapping up here, I just want to mention one of the other big issues of the day here, which is the new NAFTA, the USMCA. Canada and Mexico are by far our most important uh, economic partners. Um, they are not just our two largest export markets. They actually buy more US-made manufactured goods than the next 11 countries in the world combined. That trade supports 12 million American jobs. They buy a third of all of our agricultural exports. So we need to get this right. And what we have in this new agreement is really a pretty strong agreement that is going to do a lot of good things for the US economy because it'll preserve and strengthen those trade ties. Preserve, it'll hold on to the tariff-free trade that we have today, our ability to ship goods to Canada and Mexico duty-free, and it'll strengthen them by adding new modernized provisions on, in areas like digital, the digital economy and stronger intellectual property rules. Um, today, we're moving closer towards seeing this agreement taken up in Congress. Um, it was negotiated to have bipartisan appeal. There are stronger labor provisions, for instance, which are specifically there to appeal to uh, Democrats who, of course, now have a majority in the House of Representatives. Today, the U.S. International Trade Commission issued a report, which is required by law, assessing what the impact for the economy is going to be. And these reports typically come out with a not a very big number. I actually thought that the number they came out with today was a little bigger than we were expected. It's about $68 billion of benefits. It, but it's very hard to capture how all, all of these rules are going to benefit the U.S. economy broadly. We do think that we'll be seeing votes on this agreement uh, in the month ahead. I think the South Carolina delegation is one that's very much on our minds. Um, one thing, though, that has to be addressed first is that the steel and aluminum tariffs on Canada and Mexico have to be lifted first. This is something we hear from members of Congress all the time, uh, that it's too easy for members to say, well, I'll think about voting for that USMCA, but I'm not willing to do it until first these tariffs are taken away. So I guess my, in conclusion, my summary is just, you know, trade works and tariffs don't. And I, I look forward to, to getting in, uh, into this with, uh, with uh, my, my colleagues up here on the stage. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Great. So I'd like to now turn it over to my other panelists. First, uh, Wendy Cutler, and, and we'll just uh, go down the line in terms of how you react to uh, what John has to say, especially given your work. Well, first, thank you very much. And it's great to be here in South Carolina. I can't think of a state that's benefited more from international trade and foreign direct investment than South Carolina. And so I'm thrilled to be here. I'm also thrilled to be here because my son goes to school here. And I got to see him. I think he's in the audience somewhere. <laughs> Ryan? <laughs> um, John did an incredible job in the past 15 minutes of really laying out all of the issues. Um, what I thought I would do in my five minutes is just kind of give you my view as a practitioner. So I worked for the US government for about 30 years. I was a trade negotiator. So I negotiated a lot of these deals that are under a lot of criticism now. Um, and there was a lot of support for our work when I first started in this field. And over time, I saw support for trade agreements turn into skepticism, 
and then frankly really turn into opposition. And when I look back and I, and I you know, try and think how that happened, I think there are just a number of factors here, and I'm sure we'll be discussing these um, in the panel today. First, I think you know, in the old days, the US was calling all the shots. In the 60s, 70s, we would go to a negotiating table and the other countries would basically do anything we wanted. I can tell you that's not going on right now as we negotiate with China. China's a formidable trading partner. Um, other countries are as well. They have their own priorities and concerns and they negotiate a tough deal. So, but what we've seen in the global trading system in recent years is really the emergence of a lot of different countries, including countries as big and as formidable as China, but other countries as well. And so we are not calling the shots. And I think as a result, that makes Americans uncomfortable. And it leads to a lot of uncertainty. Um, what really is our role and what role should we be playing in the, inter in the international trading system? Um, I would also say that the trade agenda and issues we negotiate in trade agreements have really expanded over the years, and that's caused, frankly, a lot of controversy. In the old days, as John mentioned in one of his slides, we were basically negotiating the reduction of tariffs, the reduction of really what are import taxes. And now when you look at our trade agenda, we're dealing with issues like food safety, we're dealing with issues like pharmaceutical patents, we're dealing with lots of other regulations. And frankly, that's become kind of controversial, not only in the United States, but in other countries as well. And third, I would say that um, we haven't done a great job in helping those left behind by trade. John's slides do a great job in showing all the benefits of trade, but we need to be honest, there are costs to trade um, in, in terms of lost jobs, companies moving factories overseas, outsourcing jobs to other countries. The US government over the years has put into effect a trade adjustment assistance program to help certain workers who've been affected by trade, but frankly, that hasn't been very effective. And so our adjustment programs and our domestic programs to really restore our competitiveness haven't come hand in hand with a lot of these trade agreements which I think has eroded a lot of support um, for international trade. And finally, I would just say here, as we've seen um, the trade, as trade has skyrocketed from you now being what, 20% of GDP to 40% of global GDP, we've also seen you know, technologies evolve and really disrupt our economies um, and um, lead to greater productivity, loss of trading, loss of jobs, and the reason I mention this is because a lot of people blame trade agreements when really a lot of the disruption has really been caused more by tech technological advancements. And so this kind of discontent and skepticism has been building up for many years. I think when President Trump became president, he kind of took it to a new level. And as John mentioned, he did kind of unconventional things in terms of raising tariffs against a whole slew of countries, including our allies and friends, um, and taking other actions. And if 2018 was kind of the year of the tariff, it's kind of uncertain what 2019 is going, will have in store for us. And this might be the year where we see more and more trade negotiations take place um, and less and less tariff imposition, but we'll have to see. Thank you. Uh, George? Yes, so uh, glad to be here. So I am a triple Gamecock, so I did undergrad, MBA, and law school here, so I'm uh, really happy to be here on, this, on the stage here for a very important event. Um, as mentioned, I work for Continental, so some people may know us. We're pretty happy that United bought Continental Airlines, so that name Continental Airlines is out of there, and I don't get asked whether I'm a pilot anymore, so that's always a good, good start. But we are one of the world's largest auto supply companies. Uh, we're roughly, uh, this year, forecast to be about 47 billion euro in sales, about 245,000 employees in 61 countries. So we are a global player. And as you can imagine, with global supply chain and global production, we need a fair and free trade situation. That's kind of our policy at the company. That's what we like to see all across the world. 
We have a lot of different things that have happened over the last couple of years. You have obviously the China situation with the 301 tariffs. We have the 232 auto tariffs, which I'm sure we'll get into some more detail uh, and questions about, uh, as well as USMCA. The, these are for us big deals and big disruptors and the uncertainty of what may or may not happen is, is not good for the industry, not good for our company. I mean, if you just take the global supply chain, we supply, we, we buy products out of China that go into our other products, and if we have to pay a tariff, we can resource that product, but it takes time, it takes money, it takes resources, and frankly, it will take investment away for things that we'd like to be investing in. We, invest, we have invested a lot of money in the United States over the last 10 years, uh, we've doubled our workforce in the last 10 years, and we'd rather invest our money in, in uh, expanding plants, building new plants, rather than trying to figure out, can we move the product from China to Vietnam or some other place? So, so these are the things on a daily basis that we, we deal with from a production standpoint as well. We talked about innovation. I mean, clearly efficiency and innovation with uh, Industry 4.0 and some of the advances there ha have had an impact uh, from a manufacturing st uh, standpoint. But when you have global sourcing and global manufacturing, I mean, I'll give you an example. Uh, we're known uh, for tires. That's probably how you guys see us, Continental Tire or General Tire we make, as well as many other auto products. But we have uniform tire machinery around the world. That machinery is built in Germany. To, and we have certain efficiencies there where we can ship the product all around the world. If we have to start making machinery in other countries rather than having the efficiency of one plant, I mean, you're talking a lot more money uh, that, that is against the bottom line. So, so these are the things that we have to deal with on a daily basis. Obviously, we like to see USMCA uh, be, I think it's pretty close to what NAFTA was before. Uh, we like to see that passed. That risked a lot of money for us, and as uh, a lot of people in the manufacturing sector, you know, you have a lot of back and forth with trading partners like Mexico and Canada. So, so I'm sure we'll get into some more of these, but that's a little bit of an opening from, from my perspective. Thank you, George. Jim? Okay. <clears throat> so we're in a board meeting today, and we all talked about how old our companies were, and I think 148 was the oldest one I remember from the board meeting, and I thought we were old at 112, and he says he's 48 billion, we're 71 billion, so sorry about that. So uh, <laughs> 481,000 employees at UPS across the globe, and there's probably no more pertinent topic to us today in the world than this. We move 6% of the U.S.'s GDP on a daily basis, 3% of the world. Um, you saw some stats about jobs and trade, 41 million in the U.S., 580,000 or something in the state. We look at it as well as every time 22 packages crosses the border, we create a job. Um, we're kind of invested into trade. Um, 1976, we decided to go outside the U.S. Um, we went up to Canada for a few months, and then we headed to the real overseas, and we headed to Germany. Um, we got it wrong for about 20 years, but luckily we were private. Um, the reason I bring it up is that as we really think about this and we think about the world, we haven't talked too much about it, we have to remember when, when we went out in 76, the world wasn't quite the same as it is today. 95% of the consumers in the world are outside this country, and many of them haven't even woken up yet to what's going to happen. There's a, there's a rising middle class in China of 350 million consumers, and they want our products. They want these kind of Western products. And so this concept of trade, and George talked about it with, with uncertainty, yep, that's true, it is. I think it does come down to leadership, quite frankly, at the same time, and I think it's not trade yes or no, the way we like to think about it. It's the, the terms of trade that are changing. That, that for us, and I think it's okay, I, I do. I think it's, it can be very unsettling at times, depending on what country you're in. Um, but the terms of the trade are at issue. Um, there are new realities in the world that this is going to bring forth that need to be brought forth. Things like security, intellectual property, rule of law, things that, that really 
are the next generation of this. I'll give you a very tangible exam example. George talked about manufacturing tires and moving around the world. We won an investment cycle uh, a few years ago, and now we're spending somewhere between six and seven billion dollars of, of investment back in the firm uh, a year now. And because we mentioned tax here, we had a 34% tax rate before the tax change, and it dropped to 21. You do the math, there's a few extra billion laying around every year, and then the question is, what do you do with it? Okay, same thing as the supply chain discussion. Um, we chose to reinvest in ourselves. Um, a few, about 18 months ago, we decided to buy a few new airplanes. We have a few now, we have 390. Um, we wanted to buy 24 more 747-8s. Um, they're rather expensive, they're about $400 million each. And we did it because of what was happening between China and the U.S. and some other major tra trade lanes. 301 comes in, there were other subsections of it, and in the blink of an eye, trade moved in about, mm, about 150 days, we saw it move. If you move as much as we do in the world, you move. Now, supply chains aren't quite as nimble to this, and that's going to something we'll talk about as a group. I, I think that sometimes it takes longer to move. So your Germany move, it may take a while. Those that move first are the ones that can, and, it, and, it, and generally right out of that, it went from China to Thailand. And it went to Thailand if you had a node already in Thailand and you could manufacture there. Or high tech went first, it's going to head to Vietnam next and some other places, but all of this has implications on supply chains and jobs and human capital. But at the same time, I think we should keep in mind that there's opportunity here. Um, and if you spend as much time out of the United States as I have, and if you haven't, I certainly encourage you to. And one of the reasons I joined the board is really the students back here is you represent the world oftentimes in this university, in this, in this school. And that really does thrill me because you're a, you're a, a, a picture of the world, and when you get into your world, not the United States world, you realize the real good trade does to communities, to jobs, to bring people out of poverty, health, wellness, the whole thing explodes. And so, yeah, it's rocky times right now, but we have to stay on the positive. We have to, have to uh, get the right leadership and, and challenge the things we need to, like security and IP, and I think it will work out well. Thank you. Before we move on to other questions, I want to have you want to give you a chance to respond to what you hear. Uh, let's go to the questions. Let's this go to the questions. Terrific. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually got to start this question with the MNC guys over here. So what we, in the background of what we've all been listening to and what we've known over the past, say, several years, is this increased uncertainty about international trade and investment, about flows of goods and services and capital. Um, with we see with it, and it really, really started to get triggered, as you mentioned, with the, the Great Recession, and then rise of nationalism and populism, and so we're really looking also with different powers, and we're also seeing not a unified world at all that you know some believed in, but very f maybe much more fragmented or multipolar. So we're dealing with this potential fragmentation and uncertainty. And, and earlier today in our board meeting, I think Wendy sort of said, well, that, that's really gonna be the norm, uncertainty. I'd like you to, uh, all of you to elaborate on, on that issue in, in, in the following way. To what degree or how are you seeing your companies or countries build strategies to deal with that uncertainty, to deal with that po potential multipolarity? And I also especially want to um, hit something on both of your companies. So George with a, a, a German-owned company and a UPS, a US-owned company, but you deal also with multiple countries. So in your strategy, are you also rethinking who you are, right? Because do you have to sort of become German and American and French and Chinese and Indian or so I'll, I'll start with you, Jim, on that one. How many questions were in that question? <laughs> well, we got quite a bit. Actually, we took it from the comprehensive exams from our undergrad program. <laughs> All right, so a um, couple of things. So at least in our model, as you have limited resources of capital and, and, and other limited resources, we've always had to decide where to go. We operate in 220 countries. 
Um, our decision on where to go with what capital load largely depended on the risk of the economy we were going into and still does. And things like protection of IP, rule of law, moving money around the world, and, and dealing with generally the governance model and the leadership of the country and importing and exporting, big for us. If you, if you tended to check off certain criteria as all yes in, the, in that checklist, we come in with a lot of capital and it's a growth market and it aligns to all of this, we come in with a lot. We come in with planes and trains and automobiles and the whole thing. And, uh, and, and that has always been our model. Beneath that, if we weren't sure, we partnered. And beneath that, if we weren't sure, we went there only when uh, a, a big U.S. brand said, you're going and you don't have any choice. Okay? And as, lo as long as the country was not embargoed, we're in every one because that's the way the world is. This has really, it's generally um, the same still for us. It's much different. The country is now aligned very differently than they did today. I mean, I spent a lot of time in Saudi Arabia and uh, a fascinating view of the world from, from inside the country to out and outside to in. But in the blink of an eye, when a few folks went to the Ritz-Carlton into jail uh, or to, let's just say, uh, have their mind changed about a few things, um, and the, relative to the 2030 vision of Saudi Arabia, I changed my mind that night. And many other American companies did about what we're going to do in Saudi Arabia as far as heavy investment versus partnering. And so you've got you've to have the ability in your model to decide where your capital goes the right way in this uncertain time. And it's moving pretty quickly, quite frankly. But again, I, I think it's going to settle down. And make no mistake, um, if you think there's an opportunity to wait it out, don't be so sure. Because, because if we go too slow as a U.S. economy, Trade deals happen around us is what happens. They're one, I mean, Japan just finished one up and we're gonna start one, TPP, not quite, but they're moving and they will continue to move. And you go into a country like Vietnam and Prime Minister Fu can see what he thinks about trade in a very different way than the past. It will amaze you. So people will trade. It's a question of how we're gonna participate. George? Yeah, I mean, we're pretty similar to what Jim's talking about in terms of investment decisions. Uh, we're investing between R&D and CapEx roughly about 6 billion euro a year. So we have a lot of money that we're looking at where to invest around the world. And obviously decisions, uh, as, as Jim said, from a rule of law standpoint, from a stability of the government standpoint, from what's going on and what we think we can predict or we can't predict, I mean the uncertainty is really a difficult thing uh, to look at. So, you know, we would like to see a little more certainty, obviously, from an investment standpoint. Uh, you know, when we invest in a tire facility, as an example, that's a 50-year investment for us. Uh, it's a huge facility, and so this is not something that we're going to take lightly from an investment standpoint. W one of the things I also wanted to mention that I think that Jim brought up, and that is uh, from a supply chain, since many of us have a global supply chain network, Jim mentioned something about the flexibility piece. And that's, that's very true. And if you look at our industry, uh, the reality is I can't get computer chips in the United States. I mean, they're, they're all from Asia. I can't get circuit boards that are at automotive grade level. And by the way, automotive grade level for computer chips uh, is at a higher level. We're about 10% of the computer chip business from an automotive perspective. Um, I think the chip makers would love to probably just cut us out and continue to sell it to Apple or whoever, but obviously we have to have the higher grade. I mean, your chip cannot fail in your vehicle or you could be in a bad situation. If your chip fails in your iPhone, okay, you, you get a new iPhone, but you don't wanna be stuck. But I think from a flexibility standpoint, this is not a switch, turn the switch off one place and immediately you know, pour water and grow a plant somewhere else. I mean, the flexibility is just not there. And the appetite, I don't think, is there from a profitability standpoint. So, I mean, it's that, that flexibility of supply chain doesn't always work. Storage works the same way right now. In the 5G world, 6G world, the, the clamoring for storage of data and where to make it is really constricting right now. And, and it's moving, and it, but it can't keep up because the supply chains, most of them are not that nimble. 
And that's why, in my opinion, you haven't seen a U.S. move just yet. Um, we will see what happens in the future. Um, but, but supply chains aren't as nimble in some of this manufacturing as people think, and therefore the cycle of tariffs and movement, is, it could be as much as 20 years off because the, the physical asset infrastructure, George said 50, our bets are 30 years long. Once, now, we can move airplanes, but it's hard to fly a 747 from Atlanta to Birmingham, Alabama efficiently versus Shenzhen to Anchorage. So, so you have to balance all of this at the same time. Uh, let me turn to a more macro view for you two. Uh, Wendy, how do you see countries reacting? And yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. My job now is the Asia Society. I travel mainly around Asia, but I'm also in contact with a lot of other trading partners and, and colleagues from a lot of different countries around the world. And they're really trying to cope with this age um, of uncertainty in the international trade arena particularly kind of the exit of the United States playing the leadership role on trade. And they've developed a number of strategies, and I'll just touch upon them quickly. One I would call filling the void, and that is if the U.S. is not going to play the leadership role, we're seeing countries try and step up and take the leadership role. And probably the best evidence of this was um, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership Negotiation, the United States basically worked with 11 other countries in the Asia Pacific, concluded an agreement, the United States clearly playing the leadership role in trying to bring all these other countries up to our standards. Um, President Trump, on day three um, of his um, first term, he decides to just pull out of this deal. The other countries are shaking their heads. They don't get it, okay? They understand that, you know, that there's a lot of skepticism about trade in the United States. But they look at this deal as one that offered enormous benefits to the United States. Um, and frankly, they, they were scratching their heads. Then they try to figure out, well, what do we do? Do we try and bring this deal into effect without the United States? And I think the initial reaction was, no, it really won't be meaningful without the United States in the deal. Oh, yeah. But that changed over time, and particularly due to the leadership role that Japan played. Now, what's so ironic about Japan, Japan playing the role, for someone like me who negotiated with Japan for over 20 years during my career, <laughs> one of the most protectionist countries in the world, the notion that they would not only join the TPP and negotiate in the TPP, but then once we left, lead the other 10 countries to successful completion. They changed the name, added two letters in the beginning, to the CPTPP. That came into effect last December and our companies and our farmers are, are already feeling the hurt from that deal in that we don't gain the preferential tariff treatment and other benefits that that deal brings. So that's one example of a country filling the void. I would also say that China is trying to fill that void as well. Um, you can just read the speeches of President Xi Jinping when he goes to Davos, when he goes to an APEC meeting, or elsewhere at the G20. He's talking all about China having the right model, willing to you know, fight against protectionism, lead towards inclusive trade agreements, et cetera. Um, he hasn't, China is not playing that leadership role. It's trying to, and we're seeing that more and more. So that's kind of filling the void. Um, second, I would just say that we're seeing a proliferation of negotiations among countries all around the world, but particularly in the Asia Pacific region. And that is because a lot of these countries are very dependent on both the United States and China for trade. And frankly, they have been caught in the crossfires of this trade war. And they're looking to reduce their dependence, not only on the United States, but also on China to a certain degree, and conclude agreements among themselves. And we're seeing that, whether it be Indonesia and Australia just signing, um, signing a, a free trade agreement. We're seeing countries negotiating with India, um, and the list goes on and on. So those are kind of two of the strategies, filling the void and diversifying um, one's trading partners, reducing their dependence on the two largest economies in the world to the extent that they can. John, what, what, what strategies do you see? So just as a sidebar, this must be the strangest thing in the world for Wendy, who was the chief negotiator for the Trans-Pacific Partnership 
this 12 country trade negotiation. And, you know, you look at the agreement itself and its DNA is American, you know, like 90% of the ink came out of, you know, Wendy's pen, you know, it looks like other US trade agreements and, um, but better, you know, because it's newer and, and here it's come into force without us. But, you know, I think whether you're talking about countries or companies, uh, what you see uh, people trying to do is to spread their risk. Um, you you want to be able to uh, respond in this changing world. And I think one example of a country doing that is Canada. Uh, as Canada was reacting to the United States, which is by far its most important trading partner, uh, and threats of withdrawal from NAFTA and pressure to negotiate this new trade agreement, you know, Canada has doubled down on negotiating new trade agreements with other partners. They have a new trade agreement with the European Union. They're, they're in the TPP. And uh, their trade minister, they renamed the portfolio. It's the Minister of Trade Diversification, you know, just to make really clear what they're trying to do. Um, so countries are doing that, but companies are as well. So take the auto sector, for instance. You know, there's three major auto manufacturing zones in the world, North America, Europe, and the Asia Pacific. And, you know, if you're gonna be a global player, you need to have a presence in each of them. And there's all kinds of good reasons for that. It could be uh, hedging against currency shifts over time, uh, but also manufacturers, they wanna, they wanna be manufacturing close to the markets where they're selling. Because mm -hmm. if you're not doing that, you're not really gonna have your finger on the pulse. You hear this from manufacturers all the time. So that's one way that they hedge their risks. Um, another example of that though might be the ICT manufacturing sector. Manufacturers of information and communication technologies, uh, telecommunications gear. Now, it has happened, it has so transpired in the evolution of the world economy that most of that stuff has been made in the Asia Pacific and especially in China. Uh, but if you look today, there's so much concern uh, of a national security kind about uh, firms such as Huawei and ZTE. And if those, if you're gonna use equipment from them to build out the 5G network here in the United States, are we really secure? Is there a risk that, uh, Chinese intelligence would be listening in on communications that you want to be secure. There's all kinds of concerns about this in the Congress on, in both parties. And I think we're going to see more and more measures, as we saw in some legislation last year, that are going to push companies to spread their risk again, going back to that phrase, that increasingly there's going to be pressure in this sector for firms to have some of their manufacturing that is sort of China free. Uh, so you're gonna see some of that manufacturing pulled out of that part of the world. And that spells opportunity to some degree for, for the US, but you know, I think other winners are countries like Thailand and Mexico. Um, so th that spreading of risk is something we see in many, many different spheres. Well, let me pick up on this last point and, and on these issues of, of manufacturing or services and, and competing. And thinking about this issue about, well, we could, let's talk about the US. How do we compete going forward? How do you compete? So let's assume that there's been, and you, know, you see it in the trade press all the time, it's about skills and R&D, skills and technology, right? Processes, products. Um, but in what way do you see companies, industries figuring out how to compete? In what way should we be investing in skills and R&D? And Think of this not only at the company level, but also at the society and public policy level, you know? Industrial policies matters. Maybe that's one of the things that we're learning. How should we combine industrial policy or really a new approach to skills while trying to stay relevant mm -hmm. in world markets? Uh, George, I'll start yeah, with you. Maybe I'll take this. So, so from an investment standpoint, I mean, one of the things that we look at at Continental is we want to be in the market for the market. So we try to be close, if we can, to the customer. And tires is a good example because, you know, tires are pretty heavy to manufacture and uh, they they're cost a lot, even though we may put it on UPS here, to ship it. It may cost a lot to, uh, to ship around the world. Value. That's right. <laughs> But, but I think to, you know, one, one of the keys, obviously, from a competition standpoint is workforce. And certainly here in South Carolina is a good example. I mean, workforce development is totally key. We have to have this, the right skill set for the worker. 
uh, and we're, we're frankly, we're struggling. I mean, I know there are a lot of programs out there in terms of starting in the high school, even, even middle school, high school, through the community colleges, but you need to have the right skill set and workforce available for certainly from a manufacturing standpoint. I mean, manufacturing, you talk about innovation, manufacturing is getting more complicated. The machinery, I mean, you need to be pretty proficient with a computer to run a lot of the machinery in these facilities. We have, you know, robotics, we have what we call cobots, where we have robots working alongside workers. So this is kind of, you know, what's coming with the industry 4.0 and all of that. That can lead, obviously, from an efficiency standpoint and, and can lead us to better competition. But workforce development is key. Jim, what do you think? Um, I guess two things. You make me too, think of two things. One is that, that let's stick here close to home in the U.S. is um, I think we should remember how we got to grow to the greatness we are today with IP, with innovation, with all of that. And, and, our, and our capital model, and, and I don't think we're gonna abandon that, but it needs to be refreshed around here. Education plays um, a big piece of that. Um, the IP protection that we're negotiating right now, which is one of the big deals, and it's, it's you know, way above tariffs at the end of the day, in my opinion. Um, and, and is a country going to be able to innovate fast enough to stay in the game? Because at the very end of the day, and, and Wendy talked about it, Technology is changing so much. It's, you know, you take a, uh, I, I want, recently I, I'll keep the companies out of it, but, oh, well, well, I'll take my own company. We just built a, a, a rather sizable facility south of Atlanta um, that, that runs about 150,000 packages an hour through it. We would do that with, let's just say, I don't know, 1,500 employees on a sort. Automation has taken the heartbeat out of it, and now we do it with half the employees half the employees. Um, that tech, now by the way, we could say I, I don't want to play that game. I want to stick with my 1,500 employees and what do you think is going to happen to us? So, um, and we talk about that a lot, it, a lot. Human beings have to transform themselves, we have to transform ourselves, and this is a big piece of it behind us. So, IP, rule of law, innovation and education, you find that, companies should go there and countries will win going forward in my opinion. What do you guys think? Just, just a quick comment. You know, it's interesting in the U.S.-China negotiations, which are underway now, and my view is really headed towards a, a successful conclusion. There's so much we can blame China for. I mean, we can work with China in the trade agreements to address their industrial policies, to address their trade distorting practices, to make sure they're not doing unfair things, stealing our technology to advance their technology. Yep. But at the same time, we really need to be building our competitiveness here. Yep. I mean, if you look at the R&D funds that China is putting into these advanced technologies versus the United States, I think we should all be concerned. <laughs> um, and so I would just emphasize, there's so much we can get out of trade agreements. They need to be accompanied by a strategy at home to really play in our strengths, and that's innovation, um, that's you know, our, you know, our workforce, everything that made us a great country. Um, we need to be investing in our country. John, you've looked at the data. How are we going to compete? Well, at the end of the day, it's companies that compete with other companies. And what governments do in that context is really, um, it's, you have to set the policy environment right. And uh, if you do that, then it's the companies that are better able to succeed in that competition. And it's exactly the things that we've been talking about here with innovation, workforce, and the United States has a whole lot of tremendous strengths. Uh, our energy revolution is absolutely, it's, it's the envy of the world. Our, our high tech sector, um, you know, everybody wants their own Silicon Valley. You know, at the Chamber of Commerce, we receive, you know, 100 minister level officials from around the world every year. They all want their own Silicon Valley. You know, so we shouldn't be down on the things that we have right. But, Absolutely, our, our education system, workforce training um, are areas that need a lot of attention. Tax reform was really important. You know, we, we forget, you know, we had the highest corporate tax rate in the world. That was a huge albatross around corporate America's neck. It meant that uh, this was a, a much less attractive place to invest. So, you know, in some ways we're making real progress here. And, uh, but uh, we've identified a few areas where we need to do a lot more. I want to go to audience questions in one second, but let me 
pick up on what Wendy was saying and flip the question around. I'll start with you guys first. Who keeps you up at night? Or, so where, or where do you see, be it companies, but not from the US or, or regions of the world or countries that you think are being leaders in technology or in logistics or in workforce development and that's who you see are the leaders are going to be really the top competitors in 10 years. Yeah, so I, I mean, filling the void was an excellent uh, discussion because that, that's exactly what's going to happen. And, and yes, China, concerned about China in terms of the investment that's going into their R&D and technology. But, and there will be other countries, Southeast Asia is growing like crazy. So you're gonna have places that will step up to the plate and innovate and take the investment dollars that would have necessarily gone into the US maybe to another location. And it goes, once again, it kind of goes back to that uncertainty. When, when, when you have to sit down and make a decision on where you want to invest, you gotta look at the whole package. I mean, as Jim said, there's a lot of factors that you look at where you want to invest. And you know, if we're not making the right decisions here in the US, then you, that really impacts the dollars. Jim, what do you say? Again, I, I, I'm, I, look, I think, remember, gosh, years ago, right, Walmart was going to kill us all. Remember that? Right? Uh, and you go back in history and you can see certain times of things like that. And of course, now it's the platforms that are going to eat us all. Um, and, you know, most Americans don't even know many of the platforms outside this country. Do I think that, does it keep me up at night? Um, less so than us, it's just like we're talking about the US, is we should only get nervous if we're not moving fast enough. Um, because everybody's moving now, you see. And if you don't move, they will out move you. That's what's gonna happen. And so that edge, play to your core competency, stick to that, be a lot quicker than we used to be. And all of the things that John's talking about and Wendy's talking about, these are all movements. This tax reform we did was massive. It was a massive move and the right one we needed. Right after it, what happened? Almost every European country changed their tax rates that fast within 12 months. Why? Because that was now they're leveling level up again. Because we were, we were trying to put our nexus down in five countries, three in Eastern Europe, going to London or not, for tax cuts. And all of a sudden we had to change it in the blink of an eye. So everything's moving. The whole structure's moving. So. I think the winners are the quickest, the innovators, the educators, and the ones that uh, believe IP matters. John, Wendy, beyond China, who do you see as the uh, leading competitors in the world, especially in terms of R&D and workforce development? So, you know, you can't sleep on Europe. You know, Europe uh, is by far the world's largest exporter of digitally enabled services. They act like they aren't. They, uh, they've got a major phobia about um, our, our tech sector. Uh, but you know, Europe is uh, the other great modern advanced economy and uh, they do great in a lot of those sectors. Um, and they've got great education system and uh, a lot of assets in their corner. You know, uh, India is worth watching as well, uh, but it seems like India just uh, gets in its own way too often. Uh, you know, India is, has a rapidly growing tech sector and is a major uh, provider of, of services as well, but uh, in the past months, we've seen them going backwards on some of the policies involved there. So, uh, you know, I, I still like our odds in, in this competition, best I of like all. I like North so. America total, by the way. Yeah. I, I, I mean, if you think about the block right now, I think it's North America. We get it right. Wendy? I would just say that we don't really know who else is out there, who's going to become the formidable competitors. And I, I'm not going to show my age here because I started at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative when I was a child. But in the late <laughs> 80s, we had one person working on China and like eight on Japan. Okay, when I tell people that, it's like amazing, what, what, how could that be? And so at that point, China was very closed. They were beginning to open, but no one knew you know, the potential. And so, for example, India, which is gonna become the large, you know, it's, uh, their growth rate is one of the highest in the world at over 7%. Um, if they can really get their act together 
um, they're going to be a formidable competitor, Indonesia and other countries. But I think that you know, it's just so important that we don't become complacent and we don't get too focused on China. We really need to keep our eyes open and really look at, you know, look at the whole world and, and you know, keep, our, you know, become, keep, keep competitive. All right. I'd like to open up the floor now to questions and comments from you. And we have people with uh, microphones around. I think, uh, let's go up here. Um, and just to keep it relatively brief, and there are no follow-up questions. So stay tuned. That means don't ask them like Jerry did. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, in a world that is the quote from Dr. Spicer's PowerPoint, uh, increasingly multipolar without multilateralism, where do you see the future of standards going, such as um, one of the arguments of Brexit um, was owner's restrictions from the EU. How does that impact um, global trade and the future of investment? Who wants to start? Um, I guess we talked about it. I was actually in Davos a couple months before Cameron went back home to take the vote in the UK on Brexit. Um, and I think that, I, and I think I said it today in the board meeting, I think he made a tactical error. He didn't, and, and it had to do with this topic behind us, which is trade, is that, yes, the populist voice was, we want to go, we want to go, we want to go, and Scotland says it all the time, and all that fun stuff too, right? So, but then what he didn't, in my opinion, really, or I think he underestimated is, they didn't really understand when they do leave the implications of that, you see? And, and it's coming to light now, and it's not good, in my opinion, and they shouldn't have left. That's just my humble opinion, because I think they were better together than apart. And, and we, talk, we talk about that in the board meeting, is a real understanding of what the good is behind us versus this populist pull going the other way. And we have an obligation as companies and, and governments to make sure everybody understands the greatness of trade Clean the turns up a little bit. Let's keep trading and keep this world growing. I would agree, I would agree with Jim 100%. Um, I think they probably want a redo over there. They, yeah, well, I know. Because um, they, they did not understand really no. what they were getting into. And, and obviously from a company perspective, it makes, it's just another complexity. You know, when everybody's together in the EU, to now have somebody break apart, it's just another complexity for us. Let, let me just ask you a quick thing then. Uh, I mean, you know, what are your people telling you about Brexit and, and the UK? I mean, are you gonna sort of pull out? Are you gonna reduce your investments there? Or do you think they're gonna be a mess? I think the odds of a hard Brexit have gone down considerably. Um, we don't know what exactly is gonna happen. You know, the, the date for Britain's withdrawal from the EU has been pat pushed back to Halloween. I don't know why they picked Halloween. Uh, <laughs> But it, it, the discussion has shifted towards uh, Britain staying in a, a somewhat closer relationship with the EU, maybe in a customs union with the EU where they have a common external tariff, but free trade and goods within. Um, so it's, uh, I, I think what industry wants, uh, what industry wants is the certainty that we've been talking about here. And there's been too much uncertainty in that relationship. And you know, if you're, uh, again, to talk about the auto sector, you know, there's a lot of auto parts going back and forth between Britain and the other EU members. You know, if, if they have to go through customs and pay duty, that would be a huge change and potentially very costly. So what industry wants is to, you know, keep things as simple as possible. Let me, let me add a point on that too, because there's a, in, we had talked about businesses today, but I think that people underestimate the harm this is gonna to do to small businesses in this world. They're not fit for duty to have to deal with this. We've ha we've hired, we're the world's largest customs house broker. That means we do more than anybody at making stuff move across borders. Um, some years ago, WTO came out with a trade facilitation agreement. Three types of countries in the world are going to trade better. Really good move, Secretary Cuneo. Brexit comes on. So far, we've hired 1,997 employees in Europe to deal with crossing that channel when it comes. Now think about that. Wonder who's gonna pay for that. Um, I wonder how small businesses even understand the implications of what a border is. They have no idea. I mean, it is, it's a big deal and, and we should know that first 
before we start voting, I'll put it that way. It's not exactly the kind of job creation we were Not quite, for, but, yeah. you know. So All right, let's go back to the audience. Uh, looks like we have questions over here. Hi, um, I was wondering, how do you see Chinese and Russian investment in Africa or other emerging markets affecting United States interests in those regions long term, both economically and from a national security perspective? Filling the void question. Who wants to start with that one? Well, it's, it's a big story. You know, Chinese investment in Africa, much of which is focused on um, uh, natural resource development and infrastructure to get those resources out. It, it's huge. Uh, China has become a much bigger player in Africa than the United States is. Um, and I think there are increasing questions among Africans about how much they benefit from it because, you know, it's too frequent that the Chinese will actually bring in Chinese workers to do the work. So what, what's the balance of benefits in, in that kind of a relationship? But, you know, the U.S. could be more engaged and we're not. Uh, but I would say that um, it, it's European engagement in Africa that really um, has eclipsed the United States as well. I mean, European industry is all over the place. Uh, Europe has negotiated all kinds of a, a whole uh, puzzle of trade agreements to have preferential access to the market, and uh, the U.S. is playing catch-up. I'd add one belt, one road to that, which is an immense issue now. And I think they're up to 400 billion of investment and uh, I, was in, I was in Karachi, Pakistan, I don't know, about a year ago, and uh, watch what it was doing there. And how this trade thing works out is gonna be, uh, is gonna say a lot about that initiative, but it's kind of quietly built itself to this point where it's gonna be, we're gonna, ha I think we all have to make a, a statement on that going forward. It was, when we were trading one way, it was one thing. Now, we'll have to see how that goes, and that investment is a little bit even outside of what you talked about. All right, another question or a comment? Um, I saw a hand over there. Right. Hi, um, what can we as like average citizens right now do to protect ourselves from rapid changes in trade and um, as was said earlier, a new world order and even to stake ourselves against that and maybe even take advantage of it? Can you tell? Can you tell us what you mean mean by protection? Like S seriously, I'm trying to figure out as a student what do you mean by that. To make sure that we are not the ones receiving the short end of the stick. I, I would I would say as a student, part of what you're going to learn here obviously is the basics, but you need to come out with good critical thinking, good problem solving, and by the way, disruption is going to be part of your world in the business sense. So change, yeah, you will have change in a lot of places. Embrace the change, solve the problems, be agile. Uh, that's gonna be part of your business world. It's part of our business world now, and I think it will be, and it has been for a while, and I think it will continue. So be prepared. I, I, would, I would say that I think every one of you students in the audience already took the first step to deal with that because you're in this university and you're in this school. Um, because you're, you're here for a reason. Um, you hear you because you believe in yourselves and you believe in learning and you believe in international business and you believe in trade and you're here tonight. And so, so you recognize from a self-awareness perspective that this is here. Um, but just like we talk about countries and companies, think of yourself the same way. Think of yourself the exact same way. Are you keeping up? Are you nimble enough? Are you smart enough? Are you fast enough? Are you adaptable enough? Um, you know, do you, do you only want to live in South Carolina? Um, you get my drift is that then all of a sudden you start to shape yourself. You're an asset as a human being and then to all of these other models you become even more of an asset. And that's what we talk a lot about as a board is making sure we get it right to make you fit for duty to do that by coming into this institution. You're just talking about the, 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 the global world, world order that kind of worked for 70 years or so. Um, we're clearly headed towards a new global order and no one really knows what it's gonna look like, but I think you guys are in an incredible position to help shape that global order. And what's interesting for me, not everything about the current world order, the current rules that have worked for so long, not everything's bad about them, but they do need to be updated, to be adjusted, and to be more kind of forward-looking. Forward and so I think you can all play an incredible role 
in shaping that new world and figuring out what U.S. engagement in that world should look like. Should we be leading everything or should we be you know, relying more on other countries? And if the answer is the latter, how should we do this? How should we work with them to get them more engaged? And so, you know, it's, it's a really interesting time, and I think you guys are gonna play an incredible role in a world that's gonna be so different than the one that we've, we've worked in, frankly. So it, it may sound trite and obvious, but I think it's, it's very straightforward to what to make you attractive um, in the future workforce is, first of all, there is nothing as important as good writing skills to read, analyze, and write well, and you get there by doing a lot of it. Um, second, I think increasingly what you see is employers want people who can work in groups really well. And the one other thing that I throw out there is go learn several languages. I'm saying several. I mean, it's, it's uh, I, I know this is well-established. Americans just don't learn foreign languages. If you were all Dutch, you'd already speak six. You know, it's, it's not that hard. They're doing it. We can do it too. All right, thank you. You know, uh, to close, I'd like to invite again up on stage our, the man who makes a lot of this possible, Jim Hodges, to sort of offer some closing observations. You can use that microphone over there. Well, uh, you have uh, spent uh, an hour and a half talking about trade, and probably in that hour and a half have heard more than uh, most people here in their lifetime, if you think about it. Uh, that might be why we have the problems we have now, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this was really fascinating. I, I think you got not only an in-depth discussion of uh, trade and policy issues, but hopefully you learned a little bit about the challenges where business intersects with public policy, where things that seemingly are rational sometimes are uh, intersect with uh, things that don't seem so rational, but that have broad political implications. And that is the reality of what business leaders have to think about. Uh, you will be business leaders in the world ahead, and part of what you have to do is you have to deal with, uh, with good business decisions that sometimes are interrupted by uh, pragmatic political concerns that keep you from being able to do some of the things that you might want to do. And understanding that and understanding how people react to changes in trade policy, uh, not only from a business perspective, but how people who vote react to those things. Uh, understanding those things, I think, is critically important. And that is part of why uh, Rachel and I funded this series, because we continue to believe that making certain that great business leaders also understand public policy and, and understand politics is very important. Uh, a big thanks to our panelists tonight for a terrific job. Uh, I think they were fantastic. So please join me. In. And Jerry, I'll turn the program back over to you, and thanks for the terrific job as a moderator as well. All right, thank you. So just to wrap up, thanks a lot. Uh, I'd like to, again, on behalf of all my colleagues and the folks board and the folks center, to, to thank also our co-sponsors, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce. I'd like to thank uh, especially some of uh, our, our, our wonderful friends and, and stakeholders in our programs, representatives from congressional offices, representatives from the state government, and other trade associations. I know it takes, you're very busy people and you're taking some time out to join us. It's wonderful. And I'd also, of course, like to thank all of you from the general public as well as our student body. We are going to be continuing these types of discussions every semester, several times, and we hope that you will join us again on these and other related topics. And just to close again, another round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you a lot. Have a safe journey home.